Okay, hello and welcome. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today for our February edition of the Kidney Project Live. I'm Elizabeth Gress, Director of Partnerships, Communications, and Regulatory Affairs at the Kidney Project. Um, and today we are joined by Mr. John Baton, um, Director of Strategic Planning um, and a member of the board at Home Dialyzers United for a conversation about the power of the patient voice. Um, John is also a member of the Kidney Project's uh, Patient Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. um, John was joined or was diagnosed by, with ESRD in 2003, um, and his experiences on all types of dialysis, as well as um, a two-time transplant recipient, have made him a passionate advocate for change and innovation in kidney policy. Um, John is a subject matter expert for the American Kidney Fund, the American Association of Kidney Patients, um, and is on the American Society of Transplantations Transplant Community Advisory Council. Um, in addition to his advocacy work, John is active in the Washington, D.C. events and restaurants industry, um, enjoys amateur photography, and is a big sci-fi fan. Uh, John will be speaking with our technical director, Dr. Shiva Roy, about the role advocacy can play in paving the way for innovation in kidney care. Um, John, thank you so much for being here. Hi, John. Welcome. Um, Hi there. It's a pleasure. Definitely a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So, you know, Liz covered a lot of your biography, but I just have to say, you know, I got a chance to meet you in person Finally, just this past year at the American Society of Nephrology, we've been communicating via you know, email, Zoom, et cetera, mostly because of the pandemic, but what a treat it was to finally meet like everybody we talk about in general, to meet in person. And that was not a cliche, it was absolutely a treat and I really enjoyed it. And it's affirmed for me, you know, it takes a village, but also, the special relationship the Kidney Project has with Home Dialyzers United and you being a representative and working there. I think this today is a special day in many ways for us to be able to chat about some of the activities you do, both as a person, but also the work that HDU has done. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I also just want to say that uh, having a chance to sit down with you and talk doing the ASN Kidney Week was also a thrill for me, um, not just because we were meeting in person, but it was, I just en really enjoyed the conversation that we have. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about my work. Uh, Absolutely. As, um, but before you do out your work, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, who are you, John? <laughs> I mean, you, I know we've seen Liz has captured it, but tell us a little bit about where you're from and how you ended up in D.C. I mean, D.C. is usually a place where people end up. They don't usually come from there, but maybe you tell us. Yeah, unlike, so I, I, I've been in D.C. long enough now. I've been here since uh, the year 2000. <laughs> and so I've been here long enough to be considered a, um, a Washingtonian. Mm -hmm. uh, no longer visiting, just a Washingtonian. But uh, my story began in a small little town called Tappahannock, Virginia, uh, which an easy way to remember it is Tappahannock on the Rappahannock, which is a river that runs between D.C. and all the way down uh, to Tappahannock and beyond. Um, you know, basically, I grew up, a, you know, small town, country boy, uh, enjoyed that peaceful, you know, little uh, farm life. And then all of a sudden I knew I kind of grew up, reached the age of 18. Before I knew it, I was off to Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia, mm -hmm. where I uh, majored in political science and technical theater. Uh, an ironic combination, but living in D.C. has come in very handy. <laughs> um, then from once, you know, once uh, departing WNL or Washington and Lee, I ended up in Richmond, Virginia. But once I ended up in Richmond, a unique thing kept happening on the weekends. Now, remember, I was only in my 20s. So on the weekends, I would make that two-hour trip up to Washington, D.C. to explore its nightlife. And I kept finding that uh, I was in D.C. I was starting to be in D.C. more than Richmond. And before I knew it, I was here in Washington, D.C., uh, I actually took that unusual move that you hear people taking. I actually left my job in, in Richmond, moved to D.C., stayed with a friend, didn't have a job, 
when I moved here, but was very fortunate to have one within a week. So I got very, very lucky. Uh, since then, I, you know, as I moved through my career, I all of a sudden found myself doing more event related um, projects. And then so I became an event plan, um, an event planner, worked for, I've worked for nonprofits. I've worked for, uh, you know, Fortune 100 companies. And in addition, I have spent about 12 years consulting with the federal government, um, specifically with the National Institutes of Health, Department of Justice, and the Indian Health, um, Indian Health Services, uh, and among others. But before you know it, I decided that I wanted to become a little bit more independent. So I moved out and started doing the um, PR and marketing and event planning full time on my own. Uh, my kidney journey began. I've actually lost date of the year, but uh, like many people, I found myself with this amazing job. Career was thriving. Uh, during the summer, I started to, you know, feel nauseated. Um, all your kind of like pre symptoms for kidney disease, but you can easily think of them as other like, oh, it's too hot. Oh, I must have ate something wrong. Well, before I knew it, I ended up in crashing into dialysis at uh, Washington Hospital Center here and began my kidney journey, which is how I refer to it. Um, since that time, I've been transplanted twice. And an interesting fact is, is that I am today celebrating my four-year kidney anniversary from my second transplant in 2019. So I've been um, taking it quite easy today uh, in celebration. And now I'm here talking with you. Wow. So first of all, congratulations and happy anniversary. Thank you. And thank you for sharing. I mean, I'm trying to think, I know you've got such a range of experiences and you crashed into dialysis. Was there anything in your friend or network of family that would indicate that this is a journey you had to have to think about or this was completely a surprise from what from the familial side also um from my family side there were no indicators or as i perceived no indicators at that time uh, my mother however was diabetic and uh had high blood pressure and of course our education system kind of teaches you about heart, uh, cancer, mm -hmm. you know, topics of that nature, but no one had ever said anything to me about kidney disease or, you know, none of it. So when I crashed into the, um, crashed into dialysis, I kind of went like, I didn't know anything about kidney disease. Um, so it was a complete re-education for me. Uh, I did, since then, I've been more aware and I look at family members um, and ironically, none of my family has kidney disease. Uh, like I said, my mother, you know, has those precursors, but has not been diagnosed with kidney disease at, um, even at that point. And I think she's about 75 now. Um, and she would hit me, hit me for not knowing that number exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I am kind of an anomaly. Uh, a biopsy wasn't done. So there was no determinate you know determining determination of what caused my kidney disease um, well, you bring up an important point and you know although at well, the kidney project we have a focus on sort of the artificial kidney but i think it's important to recognize that you do not need an artificial kidney or any transplant for that matter or dialysis if you did not get into this stage in the first place and a lot of it is monitoring and of the 120,000 people that get diagnosed every year with end stage kidney disease you know you could argue that a lot of that number could have been lower if there was early monitoring and prevention. And I think mm -hmm. we all support that notion that, yes, not just learn about heart disease, not just learn about the, the other types of ailments like diabetes, but really monitoring kidney condition, whether it's just sometimes just blood pressure monitoring or you know the other conditions that come with this diabetes, you should. So I just want to make it clear to everybody who in our latest listening audience, we are strong prop proponents of prevention and early diagnosis. 
And you brought up something that's very interesting, you know, sick, you know that you crash in dialysis. Turns out the vast majority of patients that have end stage end up crashing into dialysis. It's mm-hmm. not like they plan for it. Uh, nobody plans for this, but they don't. It's not that pre- prepared for it. So, tell us a little bit about the what. How did you end up going? You went to the. Was it a transition through a regular clinic, or did you have to go to the emergency room? And was it hemo, peritoneal before you go to a transplant? How did you get to the first transplant? Um, I found out. So, ironically enough, my journey to finding out that I had kidney disease and to treatment started, believe it or not, with me not feeling well. Mm -hmm. And I went to the doctor's office. Um, They drew blood tests, gave me some cold medication and said, we would call you. Well, ironically, they didn't call me. I had to call them. And when I called them, they said, you need to go to the emergency room right now. And which caught me by surprise. So I did, I stopped what I was doing at the office, you know, hopped into a taxi and ended up at um, Washington Hospital Center. And that's when I was told that my kidneys were done. Like if I had in the exact words, if I had not come today, I may not have been able to come at all. At all, right, right. Uh, right. From that point, they immediately installed my catheter and at the time, my cath- my first catheter, because it was a traumatic experience, I remember this, was actually installed in my leg, um, which just well, did not go well as they were installing. I was uh, a little traumatized. But then afterwards, I remember being visited by my the first nephrologist I ever came in contact with. And she began to tell me, you know, what treatment was available. And I say treatment option because it was only one that was presented to me. Um, From that, I immediately went to a dialysis center. I was admitted to a dialysis center and they began doing in-center hemodialysis on me. It wasn't until maybe six or seven months later that the attending nephrologist at the clinic finally suggested to me, have you thought about peritoneal dialysis? And I began, you know, um, thinking about it and I decided to do, I did the training. Training went exceptionally well. Uh, I did um, home PD for about, I think about two years, but there was a minor complication with me and that the tube itself would always lodge up against the wall and cause discomfort and pain. And after relocating the tube uh, four times, they um, decided that it was, we couldn't do it. We couldn't relocate anymore. So I went back in center for dialysis. Uh, about, I say, seven years in total before my first transplant. So I did two years of PD, and then the rest of that was basically five years was um, in center. And then I moved for my first transplant, which was amazing and gave me that freedom of life. And then in 2016, it failed. Um, And I remember the day that it failed because we had a major blizzard here in Washington, DC. So it was a good thing I was actually, had been admitted to the hospital on the same day that the blizzard took place. Um, Fast forward, uh, after I lost my kidney and went back in center. And this time I was more of an advocate for myself, asking questions, looking at different options because I did not want to be in clinic. So I transitioned to nocturnal in-center dialysis, which is a new program, really fairly new at the time for the center that I was at. And then from there, I transitioned to home hemodialysis, which was for me amazing because of the fact that it allowed me to recover or normalize my life as much as possible. Whereas being in center, I was there you know, three days a week, four hours at a time, transportation, getting there, transportation, getting home, recovery time, all of that. Uh, Home hemodialysis to me really saved my life because it, it just normalized things. I could do my treatment when I wanted to, like, which was mostly, mostly during at night um, while I was watching TV, disconnect and go on about my life felt great. Uh, My second transplant, as I said, took place February 27th. Um, of 2019. And it has been a complete blessing. Um, 
I, it's allowed me to really, it's allowed me to do my full-time job uh, here in DC, but it also allows me to do my advocacy work and work within the kidney community to help educate patients too. So that is my journey in kind of a nutshell. No, thank you. Uh, there's so many elements of the journey we can delve into, but let me um, sort of pick on the part that you ended with that, and use the word advocate and advocacy. So can you take us down to what you're doing in general, advocacy for in general, overall, as an advocate for, as a, as a person that you are, and then how you got into advocacy yourself, and especially for kidney. Okay. Um, well, my two core interests uh, within the kidney community are home dialysis and transplantation. And that's primarily because of the impact both of those have had on my life. Um, and the experience of those that made me more independent, more educated, more knowledgeable, just more satisfied overall. And as a result of that, a lot of the projects that I work with, work, um, work on, have a tendency of revolving around those two topics. Um, as uh, Liz mentioned previously, uh, I was the first, um, actually I was, I served on the uh, transplant community, um, sorry, uh, the Transplant Communities um, Advisory Council uh, with the American Society of Transplantation, but I was also the first mem public policy member of their public policy committee too. Mm -hmm. uh, I just recently returned from a conference of theirs in Arizona, actually, which was amazing. Um, I also participate in a lot of, uh, in several research projects uh, currently, and I've been asked to do a couple more, which we're looking at. Um, of course, I spend a considerable amount of time advocating with for home dialysis, which a, um, Home Dialysis United um, allows me to really reach and focus in, um, on that particular um, issue, which is, like I say, also just extremely important to me because of my own experience. Now, as to how I got into advocacy, I have to give that to uh, Quality Insights ESRD Network 5. When I crashed on dialysis the second time, well, not crashed, but yeah, lost, well, crashed, ended up, um, I was looking for ways of advocating. And each um, each series of states has their own network. Like I'm in what's called Network 5, which is Virginia, West Virginia, Washington, D.C., and Maryland. And that was my first foray into advocacy work. That was quickly followed up by my first advocacy day with the American Kidney Fund. And from that point, it has just been a, what I feel sometimes is a nonstop um, foray into advocacy from the ASN Kidney Week to um, the National Kidney Foundation Science Clinical Meetings, uh, to individual projects that I am working on currently here in Washington, D.C. that uh, I have um, sort of, that I'm currently spearheading. And unfortunately, I can't really share much with those right now, but you'll probably be hearing them by the end of March. <laughs> yeah, um, no, we, 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 we really look forward to that because I think it's so important that, you know, there's an active uh, uh, role for the kidney community in Washington, D.C. I was thinking as you as you talked about, you know, advocacy and the work you do, you've, you've gone the whole gamut of the kidney experience, if you will. You've done in-center hemodialysis. You've done the home hemodialysis, the nocturnal, you've done the PD, you've done a transplant. Um, if you look at all that, um, and obviously you are spending time uh, with home dialysis, you know, and really an advocate, for uh, dialyzing at home. Uh, could you talk a little bit about who HDU is mm -hmm. and what you've been doing in terms of advocacy or more generally what you do in that role in your HDU role for dialysis patients? Sure. Um, well, Home Dialysis United is a 5013C, that uh, nonprofit. And its core mission is really to provide education and outreach to patients and educate them about the benefits of home dialysis, um, specifically peritoneal dialysis or PD or um, HHD or otherwise known as home hemodialysis. 
um, and educating people about the benefits that you get from these, um, these modalities of treatment, ranging from freedom of mobility to uh, more control over your own life, uh, you know, better outcomes with regards to your health, uh, less hospital stays, um, the full gambit of benefits that are, um, you know, available to people who choose home therapies. Uh, we also advocate a lot. We work with a lot of partner organizations in order to be able to get the word um, out about the current um, home dialysis options, but also the future options, which is one of the things that, you know, that has brought the Kidney Project and Home Dialysis United together over the past few years is because your work and um, new technologies is something that intrigues all of us and is desirable for all of us. Because, you know, as, as we know, kidney, there is, you know, an expectation that kidneys may not last past a certain, an average time. And so every transplant patient is faced with the option of knowing that they may have to take one step back at some point in time. Mm -hmm. God forbid that happens, but it's a reality that we live with. And the technology that you're working on, I mean, we can't, you know, I, I can't, I am, I can't, I get excited because I'm enthusiastic about the developments and the potential of how many lives it will impact um, once it goes to market. So, and you asked me what my role is. My role is pretty much to identify opportunities for HDU to expand. Um, and to consult with uh, the executive director on those. So, yeah, I think, you know, for the audience there, the Kidney Project and HDU have been collaborating for several years. Mm -hmm. um, as I was reflecting on our discussion today, you know, my, I, I recalled my first engagement with HDU, which was a me uh, meeting some of the key people in HDU in Las Vegas in 2016. That seems like a long time ago, it was, but it was a meeting where uh, I got to meet some of the passionate members. It actually would have been, it was a relatively small meeting because of travel challenges, only a small group of people actually came for the HDU meeting. But the positive side of it was I was got to spend time really getting to know uh, many of the HDU folks, and that time you're you are still not in as in you're not involved at HDU at the time, I don't think. Mm -hmm. But at least you. Uh, but I got to learn, and then we got to meet HDU folks at the ASN and the Kidney Health Initiative meetings, and I was struck by their dedication to really improving what they could do for patients, and also supporting us, like uh, in the research community, and in encouraging us, and just being there saying, you know, how can we help? What can we do? And we really believe in what you're doing. So that was so important for people on the Kidney Project development team, research to hear. So I left uh, with a lot of enthusiasm from that meeting and subsequent meetings. And then we did a formal survey of patients to get some insights in patient preferences for what do they think would be important for the kind of, for the technology we're developing, and HD was one of the primary um, groups that we collaborated with to get the survey out, and we got a meaningful, scientifically valid survey that we presented uh, the results at American Society of Nephrology a few years back. But more importantly, it's guiding our thinking, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. So, as scientists and developers, we have some goals we want to develop, and often in engineering and biomedical engineering, those goals are often um, defined by the clinical input as they should be. What I learned from the patients and the patient advocates is it's great to get the clinical input, but remember for many of us, even the incremental things that you may not think are important are actually important. And so what do you mean by that? Well, the quality of life for a patient dialysis is important. And for us, improving the quality of life is not something that comes secondary to just improving health. You should have to think about it right at the beginning and yes. get things that are in, get the items that are important to patients. So one of the things that to put in perspective for the listening audience, you know, patient mobility. I think this is a heard over and over again. What we really want to do is to be able to travel. 
And yes, maybe you're making an artificial kidney. It doesn't have to work 100% right away. But if it allows us to work beyond the ability to be on dialysis, mm -hmm. but allows us to travel, that's a big deal. Now, for some of the people that may say, of course, that sounds reasonable. But as the technology developers, that was insight. That guided our thinking to what we call the minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. And among one of the outcomes is, hey, maybe we do not need to develop the full artificial kidney. Can we actually make dialysis better? Yes. And as we talk about, can we make home dialysis, home hemodialysis better? And that led to one of the projects that we are currently pursuing using the same technology. So I have a very uh, special place in my heart in the kidney project community for what HDU does. We look forward to working longer with HDU and very recently, uh, um, I don't know that we actually have talked about this. We've launched a newsletter with your help to educate the bigger community. And so what you're doing in terms of helping us move forward is tremendous because for us getting that input from the patient community, not only inspires us, but also guides us on, hey, some there's some milestones we can readily achieve in a more uh, meaningful time frame for patients that may not have to be the ultimate goal that a clinical person may want. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, um, maybe one, one of the things I'd like to ask is, you know, what would you say is unique for the home dialysis population in terms of their interest in new therapies versus maybe the other people in the kidney disease spectrum? I would say one of the things that is unique about the about the community is its desire to be independent um, and seeking technologies that are going to allow them to do that. Um, I mean, we come we we come fully with the understanding that we have kidney disease and that treatment is required. Now, with that said, no one no one wants to do dialysis. If I, if I I've never heard someone says, "Oh, wow." I can't wait to get to done, you know, get over to the dialysis center and be have two people stick me and, you know, draw blood and sit there for four hours. I've never heard that. Um, but what I do hear in the community is we want better. We want an improved experience. Um, and with regard to moving to new technologies, I think that is one of the key characteristics of the community is we want better. We want, um, yeah, I, I really can't sum it up any better than that. It's Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting you say you want better, and I think that's important. And we know better can happen in different gradations, right? You could have the <laughs> transformative better, you could have the incremental better, and then you could have in between them. Um, why, do, why do you think that this has not been focused on, you know, Dallas has been around for, what, 60 years? Why hasn't been, been this more of a, an issue in the past, say before the last ten years or so. Um, are you you're asking me why isn't home why isn't yes. our home therapy is not more prevalent? Um, exactly. Well, first, I think it's kind of it's what I call a cultural shift. People are learning. People have to learn about it first, so there has to be an educational pro, um, pathway for people to actually learn about home dialysis. And in order for that to happen, you know, there have to be kind of open discussions within the places where people go to have dialysis. So if you're in the dialysis center, the dialysis center needs to inform you about your kidney options. Um, and as you know, as I've experienced and heard from other patients, that doesn't always happen like one would expect it to. Um, another thing I think that needs to change as well is how people move from diagnosis to treatment options. Um, in a number of countries, you get diagnosed with kidney disease, you go home. Uh, in the US, however, you get diagnosed with kidney disease, you go into a center. And with a complete bypass of what your other options are, it's like you have kidney disease, you're going here, and so, and once you get to the dialysis center, you're sort of dependent upon information free, flowing freely, but that information does not flow freely. So in part, it's education. In part, it's kind of systemic. Um, 
And until those two, until that culture shift can change where home dialysis is presented as an option, like just as, just as sending someone to center, it, it should be, these are your options. You have peritoneal, home dial, um, home dialysis, dial, um, dialyzing, uh, peritoneal dial, dialyzing, or kidney transplant. And these are your options. So now let's work on the one that's best for you. I was going to say, um, as you mentioned this, I mean, this was the same case with you. You were not given these choices, right? You just had no Correct. idea. You actually, all, all you knew was in, you're going into in-center, right? Correct. I, yeah, I, like I said, I crashed. And I would have understood if I had to start out in-center before moving to a home modality, but it was never discussed. It was never presented. Um, it literally took me six months before I knew of any other options. And I have to admit that was a little bit because of me, because I didn't want to be in center. It was like I was getting frustrated with being in center. I will, I will share a little personal note. I tend to be what's called an introverted extrovert. I love going out. I love doing things, especially if it's work related. I can do it very easily. But I also prefer my quiet home, <laughs> my books, particularly my comic books, and that relaxation and that kind of like independent somewhat alone time and going to dialysis center does not afford you that by a long shot and i got to the point where i was asking questions it was like an endless barrage of questions to my nephrologist you know what can i do i don't want to do this anymore what are my options and so it actually began with me complaining a little bit about the fact that i wasn't feeling happy with what I was doing. You actually bring up something that I've heard over and over again from many of the patients, and especially in the home dialysis community, the HDU community, that many of them had to have had to be the troublemakers. She has a famous <laughs> word, big trouble it's for us to get the attention. And that hopefully is changing. Um, and I think there'll be more uh, emphasis on providing options. Before we go into some of the other questions, I was thinking like, you know, you talk about advocacy, you obviously, you're a person who just spoke up. Um, over the years, I mean, what do you think you've seen in terms of policy changes because of the kinds of advocacy at an individual and a, at a group level that you can point to and we can build on as a group? Well, I know that there's been a lot of conversations, you know, about payment models. Um, you know, within CMS to sort of encourage the foster the encouragement of people doing, you know, being referred to home therapies and uh, training programs for the success of home therapies. I know that that is one of the policies that's been, you know, um, been, you know, put forth. Uh, another is currently there is a home dialysis bill that is currently up that people are now fostering basically to encourage to set up the better systems basically for people to be able to select, choose and successfully complete home dialysis. Um, it's actually one of the issues I'll be speaking about um, during our congressional briefings and congressional meetings this week. Um, those I say will probably be the two most relevant policy changes that are currently being discussed or at least to, um, um, based on my knowledge. Now, I know that there are others, but I'm not quite sure how far they have, they've, they've come. Um, I will tell you that if you go to the Home Dialysis United website, uh, which is just, um, I'm sure Home Dialyzers and Dialyzers is spelled D-I-A-L-Y-Z-O-R-S United um, will allow you to get some more information. And also if you join our Facebook group, you'll also, which is HDU News, um, you will uh, get more information about ongoing um, ongoing policies with regards to um, home dialysis in particular. So you bring up a very good point about the payment models. And I think when we'll talk about, you know, when I get asked questions about, you know, what are some of the challenges we have to deal with? I mean, those kinds of business type issues are very important. Mm -hmm. And having a group like HDU and others sort of help move those, for, those types of issues forward is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And it, re it really requires a village to move the needle on those kinds of issues. And for us, uh, you know, we can work on the technology, we can get to a certain point, but ultimately 
the, I, the way we think about it or the kidney projects is not we're not just building it we're not doing a research project we want to get this to the people that need it and to do that you have to think in terms of scale up both on the technology but even on the business side right and yes. how there's a lot of other things that come in market you know regulatory manufacturing mm -hmm. distribution and the like so no yeah. thank you for thank you for doing what you do and thank you for the partnership that you have with us. And I know, Mike, the community that we deal with here is very excited for that support. Thank you so much. And we are so happy to have you doing the work that you are doing. Um, you, can't, you, can't, you can't begin to fathom just how excited we are um, to see everything you're doing come to fruition. So I would like to think today a little bit about you know, some of the questions that we've already had uh, and that are going to come in uh, through our channels in a bit, but are there questions you have uh, for me uh, and the kidney project that uh, I can answer? Actually, I do. Um, it's one thing to know that you are working on the projects, but how did you get there? I mean, how did you how did you wake up one morning and go, <laughs> "This is what I deem important," and now I have to strategize on how to get there and take on this this enormous task yeah i can i can step back you know a little bit about how i got involved in the first place and it was not that i had the experience that you and others in the patient community did that's not the way that's clearly not the way i got into it i got into it because i, I ha, i'm a biomedical engineer i work in technology i was looking to apply the technology toolkit to clinical conditions that needed additional solutions. Mm -hmm. And my clinical partner that many of the people in the audience know, Dr. William Fizel, he came to me and said, you know, Shivo, seems like you're getting your career started. Maybe you can use your knowledge to help advance technologies for dialysis patients. I said, what do you mean? I thought, you know, we have a solution already. And he walked me, uh, this was in years ago. He walked me from one building to another in Ohio, where I was at the time, at the Cleveland Clinic, every hospital, and said, you know, here's a dialysis machine. Here's a machine that was used about 15 years ago. It's not very much different. Maybe we have, at the time, an LCD screen versus knobs and a CRT screen, the cathode ray tube screens. But it's fundamentally the same procedure. So I thought, okay, maybe I can do something with my engineering training. As I got to learn more about what dialysis was, I would ask questions and said, look, dialysis as it's practiced in the clinic is not physiological. Clearly there must be something better. And then that challenged us to think about, well, let's work all the way to the end and say, what is the one goal? Well, one goal is to see if we cannot provide something that does the functions of a kidney, a total artificial kidney. And can we work with from backwards from that? So we set up a, an end vision, if you will, what is a total artificial kidney? And I said, okay, this is an interesting science research project. I'll work on it on the side. I was working on a few other things. But he would he really encourage me and say, no, there's something you can do here that is not being done. And over the years, uh, he also dedicated his time between the clinic and research. And the research portion of his time, he worked with me. And we started making advances. And we clearly identified one big limitation of existing dialysis technology was the dialyzer cartridge. And a lot of the challenges and the bulkiness of current dialysis procedures was because of the inherent limitations of the dialyzer cartridge. Some of those may not be apparent to all the people that are on dialysis, but for example, it's a material that does not filter blood as well as your native kidneys. It does not provide all the functions, obviously, as your native kidneys. And then the materials can react adversely with the body. And they're bulky. So when we looked at all that I said that with my engineering, I can make something that's a better membrane technology and maybe it mimics the kidneys filter membrane. Mm -hmm. And then that got us thinking, well, if you're gonna make a better membrane, maybe we can put in some kidney cells to provide some of the other functions that dialysis cannot. And that has been the vision 
that on the technology side drove us. Around the early 2010s, I got to go to some of these uh, meetings where there are kidney patients. Mm -hmm. And the Kidney Health Initiative was being launched by American Society of Nephrology. And at one of these meetings uh, where HDU representatives were, but also other patients, I just got to hear from a lot of people who were patients saying, Dr. O, you know, this is far away, but we are very enthusiastic about what you're working on. Mm -hmm. And over the years, you know, I think along with my colleague, Dr. Fizel, we've basically come to the point like we're going to continue pushing this, not just as a research project in an academic setting as in a university, but something we can get as close as we can to patients and that'll require a partnership. So what I learned along the way was that I can develop the technology, I can bring clinical people on board, but to get it to the people that need it will also need support from the people that can help on the business people who can help on regulatory, people who can help with reimbursement. And to do all that, sometimes you need advocates. And not only that, but also as we through this process, we meet patients who inspire us and say to us, keep going. It's a journey, don't give up. So that is my uh, beginning of the kidney project and the journey continues to this day. So, so as your journey continues, you asked me about some barriers. I want to ask you about what barriers are currently um, are currently being presented to you that you feel that you have to overcome, and what can I do to help you know or help you overcome some of those barriers? Yeah, I think you know, in some ways, I mean, the community has already helped us overcome the some of the barriers. So, for one of the initial barriers was how do we get to the final goal? And the final goal being an implantable artificial kidney. And you might imagine that's a pretty ambitious undertaking. It is, no mm -hmm. doubt. But, and we see that as, wow, that's an, that almost to some people say, that's such like, that's like, hey, we gotta go to them. We gotta go to Mars. How are we gonna get there? Okay. But I think the way I think about it is when I talk to the patient groups, they basically said, can you do something to make our lives easier? It doesn't have to be 100% functional kidney like a native kidney, but if it can allow us to be free to travel, to eat and drink more liberally, that would be a big help. So that one, one is basically understanding what the barriers are also from the patient side. We can talk about the technical barriers, and but I think what we learned was the patient barriers are in mobility and just having a quality of life improvement, a big deal, you already said it. You have you don't wanna go in center three times a week. You wanna do this in the right. convenience. The ultimate convenience is do it anytime, anywhere, uh, and you can do it while you're traveling. That's but right. also doing it in the comfort of your own home. So we ended up laying out a staged approach. So most of the, most of the audience here knows our end goal is a total artificial kidney, implantable bioartificial kidney, IBAC we call it. And that's going to be completely surgically implanted. It'll provide continuous treatment. And we think we can make this work without the need for immune suppression drugs and without the need for blood thinners. And that's our end goal. And we also learn from the patients, it doesn't have to be 100%. If you get patients to 30 to 40% of kidney function, which means they're not on dialysis, they can live a more or less normal life as you probably did before you crash because you didn't know all this stuff that's happening. Right. Yes. So if we can get you off dialysis to a point where you do not need dialysis, you can manage your condition through lifestyle and medications. So I think one is don't have to worry about 100% implantable artificial kidney. Get to 30%. That's a big step forward, Shiva. That's where you heard that. The second thing we heard was from the patients, you know, home hemodialysis for the people that practice it, it's so beneficial and they like it. You've explained that to us today. But for some, we've heard that, gosh, you know, I've tried it, but I get burnt out. I'm 
I'm also afraid of trying it out because, you know, I got to learn this process. I do not feel comfortable with needles. Uh, the machine seems like, you know, like Bill says, it looks like, you know, the control terminal at Chernobyl. <laughs> you got all these knobs going on and on. So can't you make it easier? Actually, we had not thought about that initially, but in the context of our product, and this is where I think it's uh, <laughs> historical, you know, um, interest is we're at the FDA talking about how do we think about moving our artificial kidney to clinical studies. Mm -hmm. And one of the discussions was, you know, you have to show the materials are safe with blood. And in fact, you might actually do that just by using the filter itself. If you do not, if it doesn't, if it doesn't pass that test, maybe you need to rethink about how you do this. Now we felt confident it would pass, but they made it, they made the point that you actually have to show it. So, and you can actually do this without using the kidney cells. So as we're thinking through this concept of, okay, let's just test the filter for blood safety. It struck us that what the way to test the efficiency, the test, the safety, you'd have to do some sort of clearance studies like you do in dialysis. And that led to the idea that, hey, maybe what we have is a simple system that allows you to implant the mechanical component of the artificial kidney, just the filter unit, the dialyzer cartridge, if you will. But the rest of, but without cells, but then have catheters come out and you do pass dialysis through. Initially, this was just going to be about testing for the FDA studies. But then as we learned and got input from people, they said, well, if you do that, that means you have something that does not require blood to come out. The blood is inside. You do not need needles to access this implanted device because you only have catheters. So you have got hemodialysis without needles and no blood outside the body. And that led us to think about another which we call IHEMO, we can talk about that, but that's the next stage. So as it is really talking through engineering, but also patients, also clinicians, we get, to, and in this case, also through the FDA, that we got these elements that guide us in thinking about, you know, what is the staged path? So it's a staged path. And this work is important because it builds on each other, but the ultimate goal is still an implantable bioartificial kidney that works for every purpose, like a transplant kidney without worrying about the shortage uh, challenges that we have to deal with transplant kidneys. Okay. Well, I know you mentioned, you touched on something a few, um, a few moments ago about patients and you know what you've heard from them. And I know that one of the things when I, I, talk, I do talk to patients quite frequently, I'm fortunate enough to allow that some of the dialysis centers actually here allow me to come in and talk, you know, with their patients and so forth. Um, I know that when someone ever asks me or says that they're afraid or they're not sure about, you know, doing something, I always go back to the what I call the bike theory. When you were riding a bike, you didn't know how to ride a bike. You were scared. You had the, you know, the little try the little training wheels on. And then all of a sudden those training wheels came off and you, you know, learned how to ride your bike. You know, there was still fear there, mm -hmm. but you learned the same thing is true with a car. You know, when you get behind the wheel of a car, you're terrified, you're excited and you're terrified. You don't want to, you know, part of you says no, part of you says yes, but you ultimately learn how to do it. When you mm -hmm. enter the workforce, the same thing applies. You are afraid, you learn, you develop confidence and you and you begin to move on. So I did want to touch on that because it was something that kind of I hear a lot from patients. And with regard to the mobility issue, I will tell you uh, because I've actually had this debate with a couple of people about the about traveling. Like travel is an important core part, but mobility is the key. Being able to simply go across the border of your next state and visit with friends and relatives, you know, but still being able to come back and knowing freely that you need either your dialysis there or you can come back to do it. You don't have to wait on a clinic time. Mm -hmm. um, to some people, mobility is just being able to go to work um, in the morning. 
and being able to work on their careers, which was one of the important things for me, which is why I chose um, home dialysis. Um, so I guess my last question or one of my last questions to you is, um, when can we expect? <laughs> that, I mean, that's a question that I often hear and, and you've already commented that, you know, it's gonna take a little bit while, but you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you that question. <laughs> You know, it, it's an absolutely fair question, and you know, I welcome it. I think it relates back to what are the barriers you see. So, there's the barriers in implementing the new innovation. So we can talk about the technological barriers you have to overcome. I think that's one level of barriers, and the other one is, you know, what are the non-technical barriers? And both of these help answer the question of when will this be ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's just start off with the technological barriers. So I think for the artificial kidney, you know, we have to have a mechanical component and a cellular component. Over the pandemic, we took all the knowledge we had in design and engineering and brought the mechanical component and the cellular components together into a single prototype unit. So before... We had this vision that was driving us, which is this end goal. We could have an implantable bioartificial kidney. And then we went back to the drawing board, started creating the components. Oh, but over the pandemic, we were able to get the components that we had worked on for years, bring them together, create the first ever functional prototype that we could put into a pig, connect it to the blood vessels, showed that just based on the pig's heart beating, we could filter blood. The membranes protected human cells from the pig cells, the human cells that are in the device, without immune suppression drugs. And at the very end of the device, we, as we, we connected the bladder, and when we connected it, right before we looked at the tip, you could see clear fluid coming out. So <laughs> as a engineer, you're like, yeah, well, this is what I expected, but it's always satisfying to see that outcome. And I'm sure it, was, it is exciting even for the non-engineers. So what we have done is technologically shown that we can do this. Now, what is the technical barrier beyond this? Is to scale it up so that we can provide enough therapy. We built a small scale prototype that created urine, but it did not have enough capacity to treat somebody in end stage, at end stage kidney disease. We need to put in more kidney cells and more membranes to generate enough urine. So that's the technological barrier. What is the barrier to doing making that happen? We have to get this outside of our academic university lab, contract a commercial foundry and have them help us scale it up. There's not new discoveries to be had. It's mostly a matter of process scale up and yes there's money because you have to contract it's just anything you build you, yes. you know small scale so that's that's a money issue the non-technical side is really coming down to you know after we even get to the scaled up how is this going to move to the community that needs it the folks like you and others that's going to be a business uh, uh, the question that has to be answered. What do I mean by that? People have to be able to see a business case that they can take this on, develop it very much like say stents, heart valves, you know, pumps for pay, you know, insulin, whatever, and distribute. So there has to be make the pathway streamlined for clinical approval through the FDA. There has to be case supported at Medicare and other insurance companies for paying for this. Mm -hmm. And while you would, would think this would, this, this would happen, and I know it will happen, it requires advocacy. So the barrier is that we have to make the case that when you're successful, this, is val this, is, this should go to the market. And the barriers there are more economic structure, if you will. Like who's going to manufacture this and distribute it? Because you can say maybe that is it a dialysis company or is it a different company that makes implanted medical devices? Or is it a completely a 
Is it Google? I'm throwing it out. They haven't said anything. <laughs> or is it Facebook? I haven't, they haven't said anything. But who, which company would do that? So we need to think about those as barriers. There's an economic barrier we need to address. And one of the big elements of the economic barrier is actually the reimbursement model. So you, your, the advocacy you guys do with Medicare, the advocacy you do with the FDA, advocacy you just to raise that, that this, these are issues that have been addressed makes it important to bring investors on board. So that to me is the technology barrier is scale up. Then there's the business barriers, which is around regulatory market and reimbursement. Understood. Liz, welcome. Hey there, Liz. Hi, <laughs> great conversation. Thank you so much for um, all the, the great thoughts and questions, John and um, information, uh, Dr. Roy. Um, we just had a question in the live chat um, from someone from Taiwan, um, and they are asking uh, their family member has kidney failure due to lupus. Um, will they be able to participate in clinical trials and, and or uh, benefit from, from this device? Yeah, so I think the short answer is to talk, will they benefit from the device? So our device has kidney cells that are protected from the patient's immune system. So the same mechanism that allows, prevents the need for immune suppression drugs should also protect the cells. And therefore you'd imagine anybody with immune uh, disease or autoimmune disease should be candidate for our device. The caveats, as we always say, is it's very specific to the patient and their condition. So I cannot speak for the specific patient, but just because you have an autoimmune disease does not make you inelig ineligible for this. In terms of clinical trials, I think maybe the question is, you know, how are we gonna uh, design the clinical trials and how will they begin? The thinking has been that after we get the technology development to a point where we can, uh, plan for the first human studies. The first in humans, the very first in human studies will likely be in the United States because that's where most of our collaborators are now. It's not to say it may not have happened in other countries, but it could, at least as of right now, that's the thinking. But once we have that, we'd want to then test this out across different centers, both in the U US and overseas. And so there's nothing preventing us necessarily to do this in Taiwan, but we have to find the right partners there. And if we're to find a partner, you know, who knows, even before we get to that point, it's very possible that, that they could be one of the earlier sites. But again, this will depend a lot on the logistics and the people that are available to help us move this forward. Great, um, thank you for that explanation. Um, this was a question that was submitted from the registration. Um, someone was asking, if artificial hearts already exist, why can't we get an artificial kidney working? It's a, it's a great question. And I, first of all, uh, direct the questioner to one of our earlier YouTube sessions where we had uh, the John Watson who ran the artificial heart program at NIH. And he actually shared his story that at the time, you know, all the work they did at NIH to get an artificial heart program going. And if there was a program like that at NIH that was as a uh, that was invested in as they did in the artificial heart, no doubt would have had, had an artificial kidney today. I'm, I'm, I'm confident. Unfortunately, we never had that level of investment in artificial kidney as they did in artificial heart. So we are basically starting much later in that process, but I guess the if I was to look at the silver lining is that we can take a lot of the learning from the development of the artificial heart and apply to the artificial kidney. And again, if the questioner wants to review that particular YouTube, it's available on our website. Uh, but interestingly, there's a lot of work that is an artificial heart that will actually apply, whether it's coatings, whether it's how we go about testing for safety and reliability, and then also how you sort of begin with the first design principles for an uh, artificial kidney will take lessons from the artificial heart community. Great, um, that's that's great to know. Um, our next question is for John. Um, and someone is wondering, um, how would you guide someone interested in getting into kidney advocacy who doesn't know where to start? 
Um, well, I'm going to approach it from two different uh, perspectives. One, if you are a dialysis patient already and you are assigned to a dialysis center, make sure to ask your representatives for, if, if you're, especially if you're in the United States, ask them what ESRD network you're in and how to contact them. Uh, that that was my very first my for, first advocacy um, contact that I had ever had. Um, I would also recommend, from another perspective, like if you are just looking to gather information for uh, uh, a friend or or yourself, is to check out uh, two organizations um, that provide a wealth of information. Um, one is the National Kidney Foundation, and the other is the American Kidney Fund. Um, and you also have the American Association of the Kidney Patient. Um, those are three resources that will provide reliable and consistent information on treatment options, uh, you know, uh, information about tips to maintain your kidneys um, for as long as you can, dietary information, exercise information, um, and, and to a certain degree referrals to other reliable resources as well. So I would say start with those. And then, you know, each of those um, options also have the ability to reach out to provide additional information um, and to, for you to sign up to be an ambassador or to participate in their advocacy programs. And before I'm not gonna leave out Home Dialyzers United is another excellent resource for you to gather information about home dialysis, your home dialysis options, and you know, advoc um, routes routes into advocacy as also. I have a question for you, John. Mm -hmm. So we talk about advocacy. When you go to the hill, for example, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about the kind of reception you get as a kidney patient, and then also how do you perceive them paying attention to the needs of the kidney community, say vis-a-vis -vis diabetes or heart or cancer? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, the first the reaction that we typically get as patients is very, very positive because you have to remember that they're used to getting paid visits all the time by different lobbying groups. They see them quite frequently. But when a patient walks in, especially a patient from that representative's district who talks about their story, um, the, the story that we have tends to be very, very impactful with legislatures. Um, they listen to us, they ask us questions, they um, will often direct most of the conversation to us as opposed to the organization that we may be working with. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the most powerful and positive things that come out of these meetings. Um, we are continually doing an education process with you know the members. In some cases, we get to meet with the members themselves. And in other cases, we get to meet with their staff members. And so there's always the question, what is your connection to kidney disease? And so you kind of start with that question and that sort of leads where you're going to go um, in talking with them. And I think it's pretty much the same with the, you know, the other uh, chronic illnesses as well, with the exception that they have a, they typically have an advantage um, because, you know, kidney disease is still on that slow, I call it that uphill path for um, understanding and recognition. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I crashed into dialysis. I wasn't aware of what um, chronic kidney disease was. I didn't know anything about kidney disease, but I did know about diabetes. Mm -hmm. I did know about high blood pressure. I did know about breast cancer. And, and I did know about you know heart disease. And uh, those are things that have done a great job of marketing themselves to the public. And so the part of the patient voice is we have to continue to talk about kidney disease to whomever will listen. Mm -hmm. And if you lived here in DC and talked to any of my clients, they, they know that I had to do dialysis. They know that I have a transplant. They know if they follow my social media channels, they're going to see at least one post a week, if not more, talking about kidney disease and, and my life as it relates to it. And so the patient voice tends to be like one of the key when we do do these congressional visits. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think that's that's the message I've, you know, I've heard, and I think you've reiterated that, is that 
everybody in the audience that has this ex, you know experience or can speak to this experience it amplifies our message if you, me speaking two times versus you speaking once and me speaking once i think you speaking once or twice makes more impact than me speaking once and you speaking once so i would say that's a very good way to think about how we want to amplify that is welcome the community here to have that voice and engage in advocacy and whether it helps us reduce the barriers, but also anybody else working in innovations reduce the barriers, that's a win for all of us. Absolutely. So we're a bit over the hour, but I'll just um, do two more questions that were submitted from the registration. Um, the first one is, um, Dr. Roy, what side effects have been observed in um, testing of the artificial kidney so far? Yeah. You know, we've done some testing, obviously, and we said, I said uh, a few minutes ago, we developed the very first functional pro prototype. Admittedly, it was small scale. It was uh, for a short period of time. Um, we have not seen any side effect that uh, cause us to have room for worry. So what are the potential side effects? Well, the cells would die because you don't, you're not protecting them with immune protection drugs. Well, no, our membrane provides that protection. Well, you might have a blood clot because you're not using blood thinners. Well, we didn't see any evidence of that, okay? Well, the animal would react uh, to the trauma of surgery. No, the animal seemed fine within that uh, period that we tested it. Uh, well, we saw you know, evidence of toxicity. We did not see that either. The caveat is we did this for a very small scale device for a short period of time, and we did in a healthy animal. That is the other. So because if we put it in a completely sick animal with kidney disease, we do not have the capacity to treat it. So that would have been wrong to do so. So I guess the answer to that is no adverse side effects were observed in the period of testing we did. But with the, the caveat being, we have to do a lot more. All right, thank you. Um, and the final question, I think um, either of you could answer, um, but it asks, what programs or plans uh, do you have now or coming up to um, engage patients to advocate for themselves? So I guess, John, if you know of anything that's happening at HDU or um, Dr. Roy with the Kidney Project, um, what opportunities might be coming up? Well, I know for, for um, HDU, we had just initiated a monthly webinar series that's geared towards patients to talk about issues like travel tips, caregiving, uh, um, you know, how to work uh, mental health. So all those are currently in the planning stage. We just did our first one last week. Uh, those will be continuing. Um, let's see. I know that there, if people are interested in really sort of, it's getting involved. Um, NKF is having their science clinical meetings in April in the, I want to say it's Houston. I could be mistaken, but it is in Texas. Um, check the, the organizations that I referenced earlier. Um, they often have, you know, means of, you know, um, communicating and getting information out to patients. And I would also say, and I have to make, I have to be very careful how I say this, utilize social media, but utilize resources that you can trust. And the way you can validate by trusting is going to their website and seeing what information that they provide um, and you know, see what people are saying about them. Uh, most people do have a smartphone or some type of device these days, so that it is a way of getting information. But I do caution, make sure you're looking at reputable information. And the three, the four organizations that I mentioned, HDU, NKF, AKF, and there was one other, <laughs> sorry, um, that you can check and you can follow them as well. Um, and then one of the biggest sources, your doctor. Um, your doctor, your doctor, your doctor. Uh, if you're looking for information, reliable, trusted medical information, always consult your doctor. You know? 
words of wisdom. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I, for everyone uh, listening, I will put the links to all the organizations that um, John mentioned in the notes for this um, episode. So you can find them there. Um, but I think we'll, we'll make that a wrap for today. Um, thank you all so much for being here and um, we will be back with you next month. Hi everyone. Hi. <laughs>